foolish? I said we should do foolish things again and again. And uh, that's about as foolish as I'm going to get with my use of Mandarin. Um, before I start, I think it's very important to acknowledge the incredible work that it takes to put on a conference. It's a, it has a very foolish thing, having organized many conferences myself back in the States. And uh, I want to uh, make sure we thank Richard and Max and the entire team that they put together to produce this amazing event. And I know that many of you are also people who help put on smaller events and book clubs, readings, uh, through uh, the UI gathering and the local chapters of IXDA and UXPA, and I'm sure many other organizations. And uh, it's now the fourth edition. Uh, it first came out in 1998. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, and suddenly, uh, it's many years later with the fourth edition, and it's out in many languages. And I have kind of a love-hate relationship with the polar bear. Because I've had a whole career since writing that book that has had something to do with information architecture. But this is what people associate me with, this information architecture. That'll be on my gravestone. And I did some other stuff somewhere. Oh, well. So, um, I, I, um, I said I would come and, and speak about information architecture. And then I immediately regretted it. Because I had to think about information architecture in ways I hadn't in quite some time, and how I related to it, how I felt about it. And which was painful, but good. Well, it'll be good in about 60 minutes. Um, so, what am I going to talk about over the next 60, 70 minutes? Uh, I want to talk a bit about, first of all, what is information architecture? Um, I, I know a lot of people uh, sort of know what it is, they've heard of it, but it's a hard thing to really understand because you can't really see it. Uh, so I want to help you see it. And then I want to talk a bit about the falling in love part why something like this would be interesting, fun, attractive, enjoyable, and important. And then also, I want to talk a little bit about my own story, which may be similar to the story that, some, that describes some of your lives. Why you lose interest in something that was so important and that you thought you loved. And then how to get back to it. Uh, I think, um, as I look back on 25 years of information architecture, with a, a new perspective, thank you, Richard, for making me think about it, um, I'm falling back in love with this field because it is so important and offers so many opportunities and is necessary for the world that we are building right now to be a world that we want to live in. So that's what I'll talk about today. And let's get started. Let's start with this definition. Now, I hate, I hate definitions. They're boring, they're flat. They don't do justice to anything that they are trying to define. But I will try. It's a foolish thing that I will. Um, because some of us do like to have definitions. So I think of information architecture as, uh, I used to say art and science. Now I think it's a craft. It's a design craft. It's, any, it's like any other type of design. We use some intuition. We use some a science of but the main things we do, the verbs, the actions, are structuring, organizing, and labeling information. Uh, information, not data. Information is something that has more semantic value. Data is facts and figures, but most information architects work with information, which is ideas and concepts. So we're trying to give that stuff some structure. We're trying to organize it in ways and give it labels or names so that it can be more easily found and understood. OK, that's a reasonable definition. But let's think about what we're actually trying to do in the act of information architecture, as people work in information architecture. There's some questions we're trying to answer. We want to know, first of all, what is it that users or customers actually need in terms of information? But also, what kind of behaviors they exhibit as they try to find that information and use it and understand it. It's not so simple the way 
Um, I made my living for many years as a consultant. And you, if you are a consultant, know that uh, you have to have a three-circle Venn diagram. Right? Absolutely has to be three circles. I mean, four circles is very difficult to draw. It's really <laughs> ugly. And three, uh, two circles, if you're a consultant, you can't charge enough per hour if you only represent two circles. So you have to have, you have, to have three. Um, I say this is an obligatory Venn diagram, but I'm serious about it because uh, it is interesting to think of IA as something that fills a gap. So many of us start out um, maybe with a background that has something to do with content, or uh, you know maybe we're let's say a journalist or a writer or a database uh, 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 expert. Uh, many of us might be more associated with what users need. We might be marketing people, uh, psychologists, usability people. Some of us are more focused on context. We may start out as business analysts or entrepreneurs. But we find very quickly that our home, where we started, doesn't do justice to what we are interested in. It doesn't necessarily give us the skills or the tools to solve information problems. And so we're pulled in a direction toward the gap in the middle. And uh, when it comes to users' content and context, I think the gap in the middle is something that I've been calling information architecture. Now, if we dig a little deeper, uh, there are different, not just different disciplines that feed content users, context, people into that gap to become information architects. But there are also different tools, uh, different methods. Uh, each established discipline brings something to the table. And information architecture as a practice is simply a synthesis of the best pieces of, of those original disciplines that contribute to information architecture. Uh, I find that the Venn diagram is really useful, for example, when someone asks me, I need to hire an information architect. What kind of skills should they have? And I immediately start thinking about uh, the Venn diagram, and I say, well, you know, make sure they have some ex experience in methods that help deal with content, others that have methods that help deal with users and context. In other words, some balance. That's what a good information architect has, is balance among these three areas. Additionally, if someone is putting together a team, I try to tell them, well, your team, again, should have maybe some dedicated expertise at least in each of these areas. Uh, so it's a good tool. Actually, if someone says, what's my methodology that I should be using for information architecture? Again, I come back to these three circles as a way of auditing a methodology and uh, try to make sure that their methodology, the tools they're using, have balance. So the, the, the three circles are actually fairly useful. Now, what are we actually trying to create? Uh, here are the components. And uh, the book really has a kind of core of four chapters built around these four components. Labeling systems, organization systems, navigation systems, and, and search systems. And these all go from sort of simple to complicated. So if you are creating a, a very short list of terms to describe a domain, maybe, uh, for example, uh, like postal codes or region codes, that's very simple compared to creating a whole thesaurus to describe a domain. So we have variation in each of these areas. And uh, I also want to make a point a lot of people, in my experience, when they talk about information architecture, they're really only talking about what I would call top-down structure, hierarchy, what you see on the main page. There's much more to it than that. There's the, there's the deep navigation when you're deep in an information environment and you have to know where you are and where you can go. That's a very complicated challenge, and we can't always reach out for the lifeline of site-wide navigation. So there's, a, there's some interesting challenges we'll talk about there in, uh, with that in a little while. Um, another point that I want to make is that many people leave out the idea of search altogether. 
when it comes to information architecture. They only think of navigation or browsing. They rarely think of search. I think that's really problematic, and I want to tell you why. This is a famous diagram. Any of you who have been in an information science program or a library science program are probably familiar with it by uh, Marcia Bates, professor in California. She came up with this concept called berry picking. It makes me hungry. And berry picking is essentially a, a model for describing how people interact with information, especially as they're trying to find information. And what you see is not that simple, I look for something and I find it and I'm satisfied and I'm done. It's rarely like that. Instead, it tends to be whoops, an iterative process that involves searching and interacting with search results and moving into documents and then browsing around, reading the documents, learning more about what it is you're interested in and then searching more or navigating and going back and forth, iteration by iteration. That's the interesting way, uh, or that, that's the interesting challenge in information architecture, is supporting this type of user journey, where it's, it's complex because people are learning and changing as a result of your design. Because ultimately that's what we want. We want them to be satisfied. We want to leave them in a different state than we found them. And learning, uh, through interactive information is what we like to support. So what we try to do in information architecture is enable people to pivot back and forth between different modes of finding information and to do so iteratively and to give them opportunities to pause, absorb and use information, learn from it, and then move on. So I want to talk first of all uh, at this point about some other properties uh, of information architecture. And there's always information architecture when there's information. It's just like there's always a structure in any organism like a skeleton. It's there. Whether you notice it or not, it's always there. It's there to hold up the entire system. So all information systems, whether it's an app or a website or what have you, have an information architecture. Let's look at chess. Let's take a very simple system that's thousands of years old. Now chess is defined by rules and roles. So this is a traditional chess set. This is not, but it's chess. This is a, a how this is a postcard that's used to play chess, or used to be used to play chess by correspondence by the mail. People could actually uh, speak and, or communicate their moves in different languages, with different syntax. Uh, this is an interesting version of chess that really exposes the rules and the roles. But it's chess. It's no less chess than the last slide I showed you. This is chess too, in an app form. This is chess, GNU version of chess. It's all chess all the way down. Chess has an information architecture that defines it, that makes it chess, even if the interface is radically different. So the information architecture of any information system is always present, even if it looks and sometimes behaves very differently from context to context. And as I'm sure you know, one of the interesting challenges over the last 15 or so years is designing information architectures that support all the various devices that we access information on. So that's been certainly a challenge that information architects, I think, have really responded to well. And it used to be, I, I, I heard, so much demand and interest in uh, responsive design. And I think collectively as a community, we've done such a good job of that, that our, uh, not just at an information architecture level, but in other ways as well. And you don't really hear that as such a big challenge anymore. I think we all kind of deserve to give ourselves a, some congratulations over that. So information architecture is not only present, but it's, uh, it's always invisible unless it's not working, unless it's, you're really having a problem with it. So I want to show you a, uh, an example of that that a friend of mine, Dan Brown, who's written a couple books on information architecture, sent me. Uh, it's actually a tweet he pointed me to. 
And he says, information architecture is real. This is a screen, a security check in the kiosk. I fit four of these categories. Four of ten. That's not very precise. Does he, do they really need to have these categories uh, be so uh, universally applicable? I mean, one person, like Dan, fits four of these. What's the point? So here's a, a, an information architecture that's not really working well. Uh, let's take us to uh, some more complex examples. And I apologize for the, the fuzziness of this slide. It's an old slide. It's from 1998. I had to really go searching for it. I'm glad that it's still there. Um, think about Amazon. Amazon is, like a lot of commerce sites, it almost is all about its information architecture. It really exposes that architecture to the world. It's just trying to enable people to find it because then they buy it. And that's all it really is. Obviously, there's more to it than that. But it's a great example because the information architecture is like an exoskeleton. It's wearing the skeleton on the outside. So Amazon, back in 1998, only had a few tabs. And like every other information system, it very quickly started suffering from problems of scale. So they started finding that they needed to have more tabs. And it got worse. So a couple years later, and then they, you can could, you could sort of imagine a group of designers who, were, who ran Amazon's site at this point uh, 20 years ago or so, just getting sick to their stomachs as they, as they tried to figure out how they were going to keep up with the changes that Amazon was bringing through its business model. Uh, already, this is becoming a little problematic here, a bit overwhelming. Think about this interface. Think about this interface. Good Lord. So information architectures, like everything else, start to suffer when things scale up, and they become very obvious. And a friend of mine made a really great joke about where they were going. So they spent some effort and time and invested in changing and improving their architecture over time. This is how Amazon looks today. And there we go. There's those categories. Now these categories, if you think about it, have been through so much testing, so much evaluation. Because if Amazon gets the wrong label for electronics, computer, and office, or a label that's not quite as good, think about how much money they lose over a year. Like unbelievable amounts of revenue they will suffer very badly if they make mistakes with their information architecture. So they spend huge amounts of effort to test their metadata, to test their categories. Now Amazon, uh, this is how they've dealt with all the, the problem of scale is they have a very rich uh, organization system. And um, you see, obviously, that they, they invest pretty heavily in search if you've ever used it. It's a pretty strong search engine. Um, and, uh, Amazon has been really making a living for years and years based on having successful information architecture. And every time someone says it's an ugly site, I say yes, but the information architecture is wildly successful. Now, I don't want you, as I said earlier, to think about information architecture as just something at the top level. If you go further, if you go deep into the site, you're going to start seeing examples of information architecture there as well. So this is a book that my company, Rosenthal Media, just published this week, Orchestrating Experiences. And, and this is the very top of the product page. Page continues, continues, and continues, and it links to other things. So I just want you to get a sense of what we would call a content model. It's sort of a micro-information architecture that's repeatable, in this case, for products. All the products work the same way. They have things that you would expect, like reviews. Uh, they have metadata describing the product itself, uh, get showing the product, showing pricing, and providing information about the product. An author links automatically the author, uh, to an author page, which has its own content model on the page. They all work the same way. 
in effect, what Amazon is doing is it's taking semantic information and making it work like data, like a relational database, which is powerful. But it takes work to think about what should be linked and what shouldn't be linked. And what kind of metadata will power these linked relationships? And when they go to other pages and how they use uh, this type of information, this is another kind of metadata, really. The customers who viewed this product also viewed other products is essentially automatically generated metadata. And then they have the manually generated metadata uh, that uh, tells you what categories the book may be popular. So this is information architecture at a micro level that we would call uh, a content model. Okay, so that's the anatomy of information architecture. What about for you, as someone who's a designer of one type or another? Well, I, I don't want you to think information architecture is only beneficial for the users, although that's the most important thing. It's also beneficial to the people working on making the system successful for those users. Here's an example of an information architecture created by an author, Joseph Heller, his book, famous book in English language, uh, Catch-22. This is just a piece of a much bigger diagram that mapped out time, chapter by chapter, and roles of major characters and how they interact with each other and when they show up. It really is an information architecture for the flow, in this case, of a story. But it's an information architecture. Could he have done the book without it? Maybe not. I mean, obviously, he felt the need to do this work to make his book a successful information system. Uh, I think J.K. Rowling, you may be more familiar with her from Red Harry Potter, does the same exact type of thing. Okay, uh, so if you are working, uh, doing any type of information architecture work, uh, you may be doing uh, things like sitemaps and wireframes. These are very old, handmade examples. I'm just showing you how old I am. Uh, there are many great tools. I know a lot of you are familiar with Axure and Vision, on and on and on. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily think the tools are always the right way to go. Sometimes it's good just to do these by hand. It gets you close to the problem the way the tools won't allow. Uh, fidelity is another issue. We won't really get into that today, but I just want you to have a sense of some of the major deliverables that we're working with when we are developing information architecture. So the sitemap is a really good way to understand the sort of hierarchy of the navigation from the top of the site down. And, uh, we use wireframes to describe major pages or topics. Okay. So, all right. I mean, deliverables maybe not so interesting, but I, I don't know. I think IA gets very interesting when you think of it as a, a cultural artifact. So let's think about the IA here. I, I didn't take these pictures. I, I, I got a little taste of Taipei from Googling uh, a few weeks ago. I haven't been to the night market, one of the night markets yet. Maybe tonight, maybe some of us will go together. I'm really looking forward to seeing a night market. But I was really struck by this image. Uh, I, I felt like there was an organization system operating here. <laughs> and I had no idea what it was. Absolutely no idea. And this is probably a cultural issue. I don't know why uh, fruit goes with sausages, goes with certain vegetables. I, you know, I don't recognize some of the food, but that's because I'm not familiar with it, obviously. But I, what I do recognize seems to be oddly paired. What goes with what? What's important? I don't know. I can't really figure it out now. Um, I did learn, as I kept looking through uh, this article on night markets, that this is a, an example of an organization system for roast food. So that helped me. But uh, I, you know, when we see organization systems and we see labeling systems, we're basically looking at language and structure. It's obviously very influenced by culture. And uh, we have to be sensitive, as people who do information architecture, to this type of meaning and what we're communicating with and whom we're communicating this meaning to. And that's why, obviously, information architects, like any other type of designer, 
have to be very sensitive about who they are serving with the information systems that they are developing. And, you know, as a, an aside, um, I know a lot of people who've been information architects for a long time who can do something or claim to do something that I find fascinating. They say they can look at an organization's main page and tell you almost instantly about the politics in that organization. So it's a way to decipher who hates whom inside that organization or who has the power inside that organization. You see that especially with intranets, a little less so with public facing sites. I'll bet you, if you gave it some thought, and the next time you look at a, a new website or a new information system, you could probably deduce something about the culture as well as the business model behind that information architecture that we're seeing. Finally, information architecture isn't just culturally relevant, we need to be sensitive to cultural issues, but there's actually a little bit of danger involved, and we're seeing this especially in these days back in the States. Here's an example from a fellow named Dan Klein, another great information architect that I know back in the States. And Dan says um, that uh, the label here on the left very, very interesting. This is John Wilkes Booth, and Google labels him, the metadata, as an American actor. If you don't know, John Wilkes Booth is actually more famous for assassinating Abraham Lincoln than he is for his acting. He's the guy who killed Lincoln. And here he's not being represented that way, but he's instead being represented as an actor very, very uh, gentle treatment of his historical significance. And, uh, you know, uh, the metadata says a very interesting message to people who don't know better. In this case, they may have a very different impression of this famous figure in U.S. history as someone who's just an actor. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to represent racism or hatred. Not at all. So information architecture decisions like this actually have major repercussions, some of which will be quite damaging. Okay. So I hope I've given you a little bit of flavor of information architecture, and that you can maybe see that it's got some sort of framework, it's got some common vocabulary. By the way, the reason that book, that polar bear book, was so successful certainly back in the late 1990s, was is it came out at a time where there were many different kinds of people, developers, designers, marketers, librarians, you name it, who were struggling with information problems, who were experiencing information pain, and they could not solve the problems by themselves. They needed to have a common framework and a common vocabulary to pull them together so they could be having conversations about information together, that they could work together. And I think that's really why that book was, it was successful. And hopefully I've given you a little bit of a taste of that and the ability to start seeing information architecture in places that you might not have looked before. So now I want to talk a little bit about falling in love with information architecture. Why would you fall in love with doing this type of work? I think it's kind of natural, though, to organize stuff, whether it's information or, or anything. We all do this. Some of us do it compulsively. We hate doing it. We can't help but do it. It becomes almost obsessive. And it doesn't just happen with humans. Here's a bird, the Bauer bird. That's, that's the best information architect I could find in the natural world, non-human. Bauer bird is actually uh, a romantic bird. So the male builds a nest, and font not only creates a very interesting structure, but I find even more interesting the things it gathers around that structure. It finds things, whether natural things, or in this case, some trash. I think these are actually, uh, these blue round things are, are caps from bottles. And it went ahead, obviously, and gathered these things, and puts them together and organizes them 
in order to find a mate. And I've tried this, and it doesn't work. <laughs> but it works for him. So we have, in the natural world, animals that are, are basically doing information architecture in their spaces uh, with a message behind it. Is this an information system? Maybe. Maybe. I don't quite understand it, but the female bowerbird certainly does. Now, humans, we do the same thing. I'm sure some of you have bookshelves that look like this, or you might have organized your kitchen spice collection to look like this. Sometimes we just organize anything. I love this example from Andrea Rismini, an Italian information architect, uh, who took a, a, a sprig or a branch of a pine tree pulled it apart and organized the branch, the uh, wood parts, and the needles. Because he can't not organize things. It's compulsive. Some of us are more of an organizer than others. But it is sort of fun to, to change our worlds in a way that makes sense. We're drawn to making sense of our world. And we do it in all kinds of strange ways. And organizing the world immediately around us is one of those ways. And whether it's simply so that we can have a, a, at least a small sense of control over our worlds, or but for other reasons, it doesn't matter. It's just human to do this. Other reasons that were pulled, literally, toward information architecture. And when I put up those three circles earlier, I said there's this sort of sense of gravity pulling us toward the center, this idea of the gap. So I think a lot of you in this room have dealt with different gaps, whether it's information architecture, or user experience design, or interaction design, or content strategy, or any of these other areas that did not have a, a, a name or a definition 10 or 20 years ago. We've all been pulled toward them. And we can't help it, because we feel the sense of something absent, a gap. Something is missing. And I remember that feeling the very first time when I was in graduate school. And it, it, it was the vote in graduate school in the late 1980s to have all students work on group projects, which was fine, except the professors knew nothing about group projects. They were signing them. And every group was thrown together to do a project. And there was never any discussion of anyone who could manage the group. Now we call them project managers. But we didn't even know that term back then. And I remember rolling my eyes every time I was on a, in a group, and I would volunteer to be a project manager so that we could actually work together. And if anyone, if you knew me better, you would laugh at that, because I'm the worst project manager in the world. But I was pulled toward that gap. I became the project manager. I think we're all pulled toward a gap. That's why we're all in this broad field of user experience. And IA is just simply an example. It's also, it's, we organize information out of necessity. We have to, because people, the, the, we create products that people have to use. And if it's disorganized, obviously, users or customers are going to feel a lot of pain. Um, it's also kind of an ethical thing to do. Now let me tell you a story about this website. This is the Department of Veterans Affairs in the United States. It's one of the largest parts or agencies of the US government. It's got hundreds of thousands of employees, an enormous budget. And what it does is it serves our huge population of veterans, provides them health care and many other benefits that they are entitled to because they've served in the U.S. military. When this site was in existence around 2004, I was brought in by the Department of Veterans Affairs as a consultant. Um, and uh, they wanted, the people who brought me in said, all right, we want you to help improve the information architecture of this website. And I worked for them for months and months and months. And it was one of the worst experiences I've ever had. Because every time I would talk to a decision maker, CRM applications started to become very big. The customer relationship management on Salesforce. And they 
do some research as well as a by uh, net promoter uh, surveys and scores, NPS. Um, a lot of the organizations I work with have research centers that were researching their customers, although they were rarely ever listened to. Uh, social media got big, and that also has another byproduct of interesting research you can do. I learned about something called brand architecture, which I never knew existed, and it has its own methodology. And it's a, you know, it was amazing. There was so many different types of user research going on. You may not have called it all user. Uh, you may not have called it user research. You might have called it market research. Whatever. It's all over these organizations being created by different kinds of people in different silos using different tools. And now my head was starting to explode. I didn't know how to pull all this together. And I found it really frustrating because I started to see interesting relationships between all these different inputs, all these different types of user research. They all seem to have a little bit of the truth, but no one had to be. And it was really a pity, because if you look at all the various types of user research that are being done in an organization, you start to see relationships. They're like, there are certain tools, for example, that are good at telling us what is happening with our customers, but they're not good at explaining why. So analytics is great at showing you behavior, but it doesn't get you inside the mind of the user. Whereas something like an ethnographic study or interview is good at telling you why, but it doesn't necessarily tell you much about the, the what of the situation with your customers. But those things go really nicely together. Uh, I started seeing an interesting way of combining quantitative user research and qualitative user research. And again, different brains respond differently to these types of research. Some of us are really fans of one versus the other, but when you put them together, they're incredibly powerful. Some of us, in some of these types of silos and people I encountered in large organizations are really strong at understanding organizational goals, and some are better at understanding and advocating for the user. We have to balance those things. The research can help us do that. Some of the types of research that we do in these large organizations is really good at training the world as it's known. So looking at the patterns of behavior that we've seen before and over time measuring performance. Other types of data and tools, research tools, are really good at helping us see the world we don't know by showing us surprises, outliers, that we did not expect if we are willing to look at the data for that type of unexpected outcome. Sometimes the data we work with is statistical. Some of it's more semantic or descriptive really interesting when you put these things together. And in fact, um, I sure hope the, the I, I can't read those words, so I don't really know what they mean. It might, it might be uh, saying that Lou is, a, is someone who does foolish things. Uh, but uh, what I want to show you here is a fable. I think it's from India. Um, and it's called The Blind Men and the Elephant. It's an odd fable to me because it involves a, a five or six blind men who are walking together without anyone sighted to guide them. And they walk into the jungle. Why they are doing this, I have no idea. It seems like a really bad idea for blind men to walk into the jungle. And they encounter an elephant. And one of them touches the elephant's trunk and says, I think this is a snake. Another one says, no, no. He's touching the elephant's leg and says, no, I this is a tree. And they all touch the elephant, and they all learn something different. But not one of them has the truth. Not one of them has achieved insight. And so, until they talk together and synthesize their user research, their findings, not one of them has any great truth. They don't know it's the elephant. It's an important thing for us to keep in mind. Because we are all working, whether it's information architecture or something else, in areas that are synthetic, that pull together perspectives from different disciplines, pull together different types of tools, different types of research. That was certainly the case when I started working with these large organizations and trying to help them with their information architecture and finding that there's actually a bigger problem, and that was operations. In other words, 
in order to get all those researchers and their, their data together, to have synthesis, to have conversation, you need a framework of operations. You need to have a purposeful effort and maybe even a new type of organization to get them together. It doesn't happen by accident. And so I've been, for a number of years, really interested in this topic of operations, especially around user research. And I got away from information architecture. And I kept looking and looking for good examples of organizations that had started to pull together and operationalize the various types of user research, the kinds I went through a few moments ago. And I didn't find much. I found some interesting things at MailChimp for a few years, and, but very little. And I kept giving a talk. In fact, if I, I probably would have given you that talk if Richard hadn't poked me and made me do one at Information Architecture. Um, so uh, finally, after giving that talk for a number of years, I, I started to see some organizations waking up to this issue and doing some interesting things. I'm going to give you one example. I think it's the best one that I know of today. And it's an organization called Weaver. If you've heard of it, it is a co-working space provider, shared office space. That's, uh, I think they have 150 locations around the world now. Uh, they're publicly traded. They're a juggernaut. They are extremely successful. And uh, one of my authors, Tomer Sharon, uh, was brought in by WeWork to start pulling together the research. Well, actually, they, ran, they asked him to develop a user research team, and he was seeking. He actually wanted to develop a system to pull together user research. And the reason he did what's called the Polaris system is because he saw this problem of siloed user research. The blind men were not really able to talk with each other. He also knew that there were big gaps in the organization's ability to remember its own research. Now, if you're a user researcher, I'll bet you have a problem remembering all the research you did six months ago or 12 months ago. Now, imagine that for the whole organization, the research is distributed among different people who may come and go in terms of being employees of an organization. And finally, uh, most of us who do research develop reports and we become slaves to those reports. We just do it over and over. And we forget that the reports are really about answering questions. They're not about being a report. And so he wanted to get away from the reports as well. And so they developed this system called Polaris. And this is an early version of it. It sits on top of a, a, a platform, interesting platform called Airtable. Uh, that's a, it's a com think of it as a cloud-based combination of a database and spreadsheet a lot of different views. And what I'm showing you here, I know is difficult to see, and I apologize for that. But essentially, they are taking their user research, in this case, I'm showing you examples from um, user interviews done on video, and chopping that research up into what they call nuggets, chunks. Putting them in this system, and then using a huge amount of metadata to describe the research. So they have an information architect, basically, taking all the research from different inputs, from different silos, and different types, and looking at it and chopping it into little pieces, into nuggets, and applying a huge amount of metadata. So all these columns are different kinds of metadata. And some of them describe different stations in the user's journey, others describe demographics, others describe ge geography, and so on. Um, and then, when they've done that type of indexing and curation of their research results, those nuggets, um, they can, through an interface, look at patterns very easily. So in this case, they have an insight that comes from analyzing different nuggets and seeing what their common metadata is. And then inferring a conclusion. So the blind men look at all these things 
they can actually click through and watch videos of users being interviewed or, or look at actual data, review the metadata, and then come up with an insight. The community team is really good at doing what it's doing, and here's reasons why. And they share this with the decision makers. In fact, they make this available to the decision makers. Here's another view of it. The same insight, community team rocks, and here are the actual content objects. Just a few, you can play them back. So they've taken user research, pulled it from different silos, pushed it right in front of whoever the user of this system is, a decision maker or a researcher. And they, you, you notice this is not a report. This is an insight. That's powerful. It's extremely powerful. Now, I don't know if you see it this way, but when I look at a system like this, I fall back in love with information architecture. Because this is a system that is dependent on information architecture. The, the nuggets are content objects, there's lots of organization and labeling going on, and it just got me thinking, wow, under my own nose all these years, the answer was back in information architecture. That's the infrastructure to operationalize the research. So I started to fall back in love with information architecture. And this idea of operations, I don't know if you're feeling it here in Taiwan, but I can tell you it's becoming huge back in the States. My company organized the first design operations conference last November in New York City, and it sold out and doing it again in a larger space. I'm very optimistic. It's going to sell out again this coming November because there's suddenly so much interest in operationalizing user research and design. If you're wondering how you operationalize design, here's some examples. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with design systems. It's just information architecture in many respects. Lots of, this is Shopify's design system, lots of metadata to describe objects, content objects, that can be reused, but obviously they need to be found by the users. It's very dependent on information and architecture. Here's another design system from the nation of, uh, it's Latvia. No, I, I didn't want to make that mistake. I hope there are no, no Estonians in the audience that just defended. It's actually from Estonia. It's their design system. The whole nation of Estonia has a design system. And I love this example because one thing Estonians take pride in is apparently boulders. There's a lot of boulders in Estonia. And uh, they so many that it's almost a point of national pride. And they've taken these boulders and they, among other things they manage in their design systems, they manage visual representations of their native Estonian boulders. But I would still submit to you that this is powered by information architecture, operationalizing the ability of many people to do design. This is a, a site called Adele that is actually managed by uh, folks at uh, UXPIN. And it's, uh, it's almost a, it's a database of design systems. Uh, it's huge. And I'm only showing you just a tiny bit of it. Uh, but it's just full of design systems, and it, it talks about them, it classifies, it categorizes them, uh, it, makes, uh, it makes them searchable. It's really a fantastically designed information architecture. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested in design systems and pattern libraries. So we're, we're kind of moving into this era of operationalizing user research and design. And it's not surprising because we've, the last few years, there's been a lot of attention paid to operationalizing development and coding. And it's natural that that thinking of scaling up and amplifying the abilities of developers should then apply to designers and user research. And so I'm seeing not only DevOps and design ops, but what I would call research ops. And now there's actually a whole community growing. If you're interested, I can give you information. Hundreds of people have joined the research ops Slack in about two months. And we're starting to do a lot as a community to operationalize user research. And uh, the idea that I would take this to is, the, uh, uh, is one of insight ops. 
maybe someday that will catch on. You operationalize pulling all the types of research together across an organization and in silos in effect to help the organization make better decisions. I think you need an operations platform to help that happen. So operations is something that is new for many of us. And I promise you, if, it's, if you've never heard of it before and you don't believe me, Google it, or use Alibaba or whatever your favorite search tool is, and you're going to start seeing a big push toward operations in the design and user experience world. Um, they all require IA. If you're interested in IA, or you're just interested in this problem set, there's a great opportunity for you. IA is not dead. IA is going to be more important than ever before. There's another opportunity. I don't pretend to know a lot about it, but IA and AI seem to be very well matched for each other. There's a marriage in the process of happening right now. I, I think of this quote from a senior person at IBM who's involved in AI. AI requires machine learning. Machine learning requires analytics. Analytics requires the right data and information architecture. In other words, there is no AI without IA. That's great, because information architects are the ones who can take the ontologies that AI and machine learning require and start them, maybe give the uh, AI systems a little nudge, a little start, and then help those systems of the robots, in effect, understand over time and train them over time to understand what is going on semantically in a particular domain. And a lot of that comes back to things like labeling and organization. So um, here's a, a, some analysis done by uh, the Watson, uh, was it Watson? Uh, yeah, the, the, the Watson uh, system. Uh, you know, a bunch of AI analysis teaching machines to understand language and understand the semantics of language. And again, dig a little deeper. In this case, there's a heck of a lot of metadata and organization systems work that's happening. You know, we're talking about bots a lot these days. And we have to really start thinking about how we're going to use information architecture to help us better structure conversations. So. Along these lines, IA gives us a sense of structure. Uh, it gives us a framing for how to understand semantic spaces. And conversations are simply another example of those. So I encourage you, if you're interested in AI and machine learning and, and uh, uh, conversations with bots, to think about the value that IA can help can bring you in your world. Those are kind of sexy examples of opportunities for information architecture today. But I want to talk a little bit about the basic everyday things where information architecture can be interesting and helpful. I'm a book publisher because I got smart. Instead of writing them, I got other people to write them. And um, as I got to have the luxury of creating books and rethinking books from an IA perspective, I found here's a Here's an information system that hasn't changed much in centuries. But I had to look at it through a different framing, namely that of information architecture. And uh, I won't get into all the things we've done with our books, but one thing I'm particularly proud of is adding a FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, to the beginning of all of our books. Every one of our books has that. And what's so interesting to me is those FAQs serve not only as a way to understand the information in this system, this book, but they have a navigational benefit as well. So if you're interested in this issue or that, that question and you want to learn more, go straight to the chapter or the page that will help you get more information on it. Pretty obvious stuff, but I haven't really seen this done before. And I give the credit to using information architectures and framing to see existing conventional things through new and different lens. And you're all this beautiful conference, and anyone who's organized a conference knows how difficult it is to create a program. One thing that my company does, as I mentioned, is we put on conferences. And 
one of the things that we find is there's so much work and the flow of energy in the room like this is so important for the attendees. How you feel and how much energy you have has to be considered because you have to have the right amount of energy at the right time. For example, um, I don't know what's going on tonight, but I know the first night at our conferences, we had a big party for all the attendees. And it's extremely expensive to produce. And we want it to go really well. But we've just put our attendees, our users, in effect, to a really grueling day, a really challenging day. And they're tired as the day goes on. And so uh, I, I'm using something called uh, story mapping that, that comes out of one of our books by Donna Leach uh, The User's Journey. And the idea is when a climax happens is really important. And in this case, the climax I'm talking about is energy among attendees. So we want them to be all powered up when they go to our party. But, they're, but the normal program, they're very tired by the time the end of the day rolls around. So what we did was we created a way to recharge them and energize them one more time at the end of the day, right before the party. And those are called enterprise UX storytelling sessions. We actually have people who apply to be storytellers at the very last hour. They each, maybe eight and seven of them, tell a five-minute story. That they these stories are amazing. They're, they're stories of pain and suffering from their jobs, uh, granting, big ideas, they're very emotional. A lot of people cry while they're telling the stories. I mean, we take our work pretty seriously, don't we? So, we delay the climax at the end of the day, and we get people recharged, and when they get to the party, the storytelling session has re-energized them, and they're buzzing when they get to the party. And we help that along by changing the mood in the room. When the storytellers come out, we come out with beer and popcorn, and we serve it like they do at baseball stadiums. And um, that's me and, and one of my co-organizers doing it. Actually, here we're, we're giving beer to the storytellers, so they're ready for the presentations. And it's a lot of fun, and it changes the whole mood. Now, this is very structured. And if you look at it through the lens of a program description, I don't really have a good one to show you here, but it's basically, in many respects, information architecture being applied to help improve an experience. So, I've just given you a number of opportunities where I hope you will consider information architecture as something that's important and valuable to you. Some of these opportunities are new things that have nothing to do with websites, yet everything to do with technology, whether it's conversational applications or using AI, whether it's creating operational infrastructures to support your design organization and your user research organization, but also just the kind of everyday things that we take for granted that can really benefit from treatment through the lens of information production. So I want to ask you to please fall in love with information architecture, to consider it at least. I don't say that you have to be an information architect. One of the beauties of this field and many fields in user experience is that anyone can really do it. And we're at a point where we're getting to be beyond the tribes. It's not important to be an information architect. It's not important to be an interaction designer. Those labels have less importance than they ever have, and that's a good thing. Because when you have labels, you start to have priests. And when a discipline has a priesthood, I can promise you it will lose relevance very quickly. You don't have those priests. Instead, we are democratizing the skills. And so I hope that you become synthesists, that you start pulling together these areas uh, these disciplinary, these disciplinary, disciplinary perspectives, tools, methods, to do things like information architecture, to know a little bit about it, so that it'll help you in whatever work you do. There's more gaps 
than ever before. I'm sure you're feeling the pull of them right now. You're doing something in your daily work that you might be feeling that you should be doing something else. That means there's a gap happening right now. And I encourage you to get, let yourself get pulled toward it. To let yourself go on a journey. When I put up those Venn diagrams, those circles are not about intersection. Those circles are about convergence. There's actually movement. There's people being pulled together in new ways for the same gaps. And IA is simply one of those gaps. And I hope you'll let it yourself pull toward whatever gap you find attractive and gravitational. Finally, I want you to think about information architecture as a way to help you make your products and services not only better, but better for the world that you live in. We are playing a constant game of catch-up. Technology keeps running ahead and creating opportunities, but also creating problems. We need problem solvers that are humans. I hope we'll pick up the responsibility of being those humanists for the future. Our children are depending on it. So uh, with that, um, I have some more slides that I have as a backup in case I finished early, but I think I have 48 seconds to go. So I'm going to finish 48 seconds early, and I think I deserve a round of applause for that.